You're muted, Jay. Gonna work a lot better when I unmute that microphone. Hey, everybody. I did such a good job on that first part of the intro. It was so smooth. No mistakes. But hey, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the April 6th edition of the Connect Online Meeting. Good to be with you here tonight. Uh, of course, name's Jonathan Jenkins. Uh, joined tonight by uh, co-hosts on the program, uh, Eric Owens. Uh, good to see you tonight, brother. How you doing? I'm doing great. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Are you? Are you actually doing great? <laughs> Better than I deserve. <laughs> we'll just let them see. We'll see. We'll let the audience judge after a little while. <laughs> but it's good to have Eric here with us this evening. Uh, tonight we have with us brother Robbie Eversoll uh, stepping in for Greg, who is traveling tonight. Uh, but we're lucky, always privileged to have uh, Robbie with us and getting him back to back weeks is just a really good a good thing to have. And we look forward to his lesson here in just a moment. See if I get these windows in the right order. There we go. That's, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be right there. All right. Um, as I said, we uh, thank you for tuning in, being here as part of the program. If you would, please take a second and like, share, subscribe. Uh, the links to our uh, pages on the different social media platforms contained in the description of the video that you're currently watching. Uh, if you'd like to support the work here, you can do that with the Star Super Chats. We'd appreciate it if you consider that. Uh, you can also do that with, um, well, uh, memberships all over the place. You've got the, you can sign up at our Facebook page on the YouTube channel. You can do it with our website, digitalbiblestudy.org, or you can do it with um, uh, subscriptions at our local page, digitalbiblestudy.locals.com. Any of those work about the same for us. So if you'd consider it, we would greatly appreciate it. All those things help out the things that we do and help us keep the lights on around here. And we uh, do appreciate everything that you are doing for us. Um, having said that, let's throw it over to Eric and let him take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to say a word of prayer at the end of the session tonight. And uh, we're very thankful to pray with you and for you. And we appreciate your efforts to that end as well. Um, I'm going to lead us in that prayer at the end of that session. And uh, we look forward to that. Jonathan will keep a watch over the feed. He'll let us know for whom we're praying, and we are always very grateful and thankful to do that. That said, we turn our attention to our speaker this evening, Robbie Eversole, as was announced, is here with us. Brother Robbie, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine, my brother. How are you? I'm doing great as well. It's good to see you here, as always. Glad you good are to feeling see you better. And Jay too. Yes, You're sir. Just two of my favorite people. And you, ours, sir. Uh, <laughs> For those who don't know you, which could not be anybody inside of this audience, but for those who don't and may look at this later, would you tell the folks a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name's Robbie Eversole. I'm preaching at the Penville Church of Christ, Northwest Georgia. Been here uh, 25 years this past February the 8th. So I'm working on number 26 and uh, love it here. It's a great congregation, good people, uh, leadership. It's uh, wonderful, and uh, we have two great deacons, three great elders. So just happy to be here. And uh, uh, there is something I do want to say um, about uh, the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. They're my friends up there. And um, we don't encourage uh, our brotherhood enough to support works like that. And we don't encourage our young people enough to go to that. And I'm talking about male or female. You don't have to aspire to be a preacher to go to the Tri-City School of Preaching because it's also Christian development. And we need better elders. We need better deacons, better elders and deacons' wives, better preachers and preachers' wives, better Bible class teachers. And they'll get a really well-grounded education there and, uh, Milton Mathers uh, uh, is one of the instructors there, Wesley Simons, Eddie Kraft, David B. Jones, and uh, Bill Haywood, who has preached in my place here on digital a few weeks ago. He is the director of the school. So send your sons and daughters there to get them rooted and grounded in the truth. Get a good Christian development even before they go off to secular school to have their faith absolutely destroyed we're losing i read something the other day we're losing nine out of ten of our young people once they leave dad and mom's nest go out on their own 
and their faith is assaulted by these liberal evolutionists and atheistic professors. Tri-Cities is a two-year school, two-year program, but a third year is available, and that is in defense of the faith. I'll say this, and then I know I'm taking way too much time. Uh, mm -hmm. Go up and give them a visit. Stop by and say hello to them. You're, they're your friend, and you'll be so glad you did. No, no we appreciate you sharing that. Uh, it is absolutely no problem. Bill um, did a fantastic job in your absence. Uh, absolutely just 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 great um and anytime you want to share something about the school or or, or about the good brother there by all means we, we can't encourage enough um hopefully more young do parents it when I'm speaking. <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully more young parents will hear that and uh see it as a as a good idea and the development of their children you know if you if you, if you want your children's faith um, solidified, strengthened, rooted, and you've done the best you can as parents, um, then for your child to go off to a school, a two-year school of preaching, uh, mm -hmm. would do nothing but further uh, move them to the next place of faith and to their development and strengthen them. Uh, they certainly would be able then to withstand the assaults uh, on a on a more on a. I, uh, um, I do campus. want to clarify that we want our godly women to go to a uh, school of preaching, whether it's Elizabethan or not, Tri Cities or not. We uh, there are all the schools that teach the truth are worthy of mm -hmm. our praise uh, and acclamation, but. Um, the, the girls would not teach the preaching classes. They would get the Christian development side and the Bible and, and uh, you know, become better, better Bible class teachers and better elders' wives and deacons' wives, etc. They just live a better Christian life and they'll be better servants in the kingdom. It will no doubt help you with regards to choosing a mate. Um, you would want one with the uh, faith that you have. And yep. uh, the the strength and, and depth of that faith would also be helpful um, in, in in one's quest to, to go to heaven and be helped by a mate. Uh, so, yep. yep. Um, you don't offend us in any way talking about preaching schools, man. We're fans, uh, and we 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 appreciate those who uh, labor in the teaching and training of, of gospel preachers. We certainly need them. What are you going to be preaching about tonight? The unwritten gospel about, oh, I guess a month, six weeks. A few weeks ago, our brother and friend uh, and fellow soldier in the, uh, of the cross preached a lesson entitled, I think it was, The Written Word, Phil Sanders, uh, on digital uh, Bible study and I got to thinking about the Gospels that people follow that are not written. So mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the unwritten Gospel tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, man, it's always good to have you here. We look forward to hearing you preach. Sure. And we will turn it over to you now, Robbie. The room is yours. The rest of the hour belongs to you. So go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Thank you, brothers. Uh, the word gospel, euangelizio, in the Greek, is literally means good tidings. In Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the angel sang and said to the shepherds in the field, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Back in verse number the word good tidings, is euangelion or euangelizo, it is the word for gospel. Now, gospel in the, in the English comes to us from the old English, God's spell. A spell was a story. So the gospel is the story of the Christ that causes us to be spellbound. So the gospel message is where God puts us under his spell and we become spellbound when we look at the cross of Calvary. So it's the good news about Jesus. You remember, 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the good news, the gospel, the glad tidings, the euangelion. I declare the gospel unto you. He said you received it and you stand in it. And if you continue to believe it, you shall be saved. For first of all, God always does first things first. He said, first of all, I delivered unto you how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. What is the death of Christ? It's a part of the gospel. And that he was buried. What is the burial of Christ? It's part of the gospel message. And that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What is the resurrection of Christ? It's the gospel. So the gospel has the elements of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And Paul says, that's where I start. That's the first thing I preach. Now, God has given to us just one gospel. Now, there would be those that would pervert the gospel, but there's only one gospel. A lot of gospel perversions and perverters out there, but still, and yet one gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Now, in Paul's day, the gospel was in the inspired man. Did not Paul write in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7 that we have this treasure in earthen vessels? And I heard Johnny Ramsey say one time that the words there for earthen vessel is clay pot. And he said, uh, we're clay pots and we all get a little cracked sometimes, but maybe we're cracked pots. But that does not relieve us of the responsibility to have the weight of the gospel upon our shoulders. And today the gospel is in the inspired book. In the first century, the inspired man. Today the gospel is in the inspired book. No wonder John uh, says in John 20, 30 and 31, many other signs truly did Jesus that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. No wonder Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration. Theonoustos, breathed out of the mind of God, breathed into the mind of man, and it flowed down to his pen, and man wrote the words that God wanted written. So the good news the gospel, the euangelion, is our infallible standard of faith and conduct. But many are unwilling to accept the written gospel. And what they've done, they've substituted their own unwritten gospels as their basis of authority in religion. Four points tonight. I know that will shock you. You were expecting eight or ten. I know you were, but just four to nine. Number one, the unwritten gospel of feelings. Number two, the unwritten gospel of tradition. Number three, the unwritten gospel of custom. And number four, the unwritten gospel of human opinion. Back to number one, the unwritten gospel of feelings. Now, the authority of human feelings have always been accepted by many people. You go back into yesteryear and the heathen back in the days of Moses and before that the Canaanites who gave their children to Molech and Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 31, God warns Israel, when you go into the land of, of the Canaanites, you don't serve their gods. You don't say, well, how did you serve your God? We want to do that. He said they burned their children under Molech, and they sacrificed them as a burnt offering unto a false god. Leviticus 18, 21 warns the same. What about the Hindus? who, because of their feelings, they throw their children to the crocodiles and the Ganges River to try to placate the wrath of their imagined gods. Now, they may feel that that does some good, but all it does is murder that child. And what about the Catholics of yesteryear and today? Years ago, the penitents of New Mexico and the Philippine Islands who beat and flogged one another, tortured themselves unmercifully, and they felt like they were doing God's will. Recently, on our own televisions, I watched it during the Iraqi war. 
And uh, the Iraqis were out there with short flagellums and no shirts on, and they were beating their backs, and the cameras were there, and it showed their backs, and they were a mangled, beaten, bloody mess. And somehow they think that that, uh, that propels them on in their religious pilgrimage. And in that instance, what they were doing was trying to placate the wrath of their God, hoping and thinking and feeling like their God was going to give them uh, a, a, a victory over America and her allies in the war on terror. The Protestants. <clears throat> The existentialists who say, I'm a self-made man and I answer to nobody but me. Uh, people feel that and they follow that and that's their Bible and they'll be lost and go to hell because of it. The prejudiced religionists who maintain that if one feels that something is right, then it's okay. If I like it, God must like it. If I want it, it must mean that God wants me to have it. Or the deluded who say, oh, I wouldn't trade this feeling I have in my heart for all the Bibles you could stack in that church building down there, preacher. Brethren, the unreliability of feelings is taught by many examples in the Bible. I think of Genesis 27, 18 through 23, when Isaac had told Esau, go kill and make me some venison stew, savory venison stew. Well, Rebecca and Jacob, they went into this plan and they tricked Isaac, and they tricked him into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. And once the blessing was given, Isaac said, I cannot now unbless him. You see, Isaac felt like he was blessing Esau, but his feelings were not right. His feelings had fooled him. What about Jacob and Joseph? And I think it's interesting to know that, that Jacob had fooled his dad Isaac. Now his offspring were going to fool him. In Genesis 37, 31 to 35, after they had cast Joseph into a pit and then sold him into slavery, they took his coat and they killed a goat and they dipped it in the blood and they carried that coat into their daddy. And their daddy said, well, a wild beast has torn him up. And he is dead. Well, he felt like he was dead, but he wasn't dead, was he? What about Saul of Tarsus? How about in Acts 7, beginning at verse 58, a young man by the name of Saul who held the clothes of those who had stoned Stephen. You drop down into Acts 8, 1 to 4, that Saul went to Jerusalem and he desired papers and he may go to Damascus and he may bring back bound men and women. He would go into their homes and drag them out into the streets. He cast many of them into prisons. And Acts 22 and 4 said he even killed Christians. And they that were scattered abroad, Acts 8 and 4, whenever we're preaching the word. You come over to Acts chapter 9. We find Paul has uh, uh, the uh, image of the resurrected Lord appeared to Saul. And Saul fell down on the ground and he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He was taken up blind. Now, God's got Paul. Well, he's Saul at that time. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Gentile name. Oftentimes I get caught just calling him Paul. But anyway, you know who I'm talking about. So it's Saul and he's taken up blind. He's led into Jerusalem or he's led into Damascus, a street that is called Straight. And Ananias comes to him, Ananias said, Saul, Saul, receive thy sight. And now why tarryest thou arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now here was a man that had persecuted Christians. He had cast them men and women into prison. He had killed Christians. He had held the clothes of others who killed Christians and encouraged them in their deeds. And in Acts 23 and 1, as he stood on trial, he said, men and brethren, I have lived with all good conscience until this day, until the day the 
resurrected Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Saul thought he was doing the right thing. He felt like he was serving God. Now the unreasonableness of relying on our feelings. A fool thinks and he feels like he's right. In Proverbs 12 and 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Have you ever read Proverbs 28 and 26? He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25, twice, three chapters apart. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Friends, feelings are not relied upon in any realm except religion. I mean, if the doctor tells you you've got a terminal illness and you say, I feel healthy, does that make the disease go away? Just you feeling like you're okay, does that make it go away? When Michael Landon, little Joe Cartwright on uh, the uh, Western television, Western Bonanza, when he was told he had cancer, he fell down at the doctor's office, did 50 push-ups, and said, you're wrong, I've never felt better. And just in a short time, he was in a coffin. If you're flying at 30,000 feet, and you lose all engine power, you have a serious problem, and brothers and sisters, I don't care how you feel about it. If one feels rich, is he rich? If one feels successful, is he successful? If one feels pardoned, is he pardoned and made a free man? Does feeling it so make it so? But <clears throat> religion is the only area in life where we practice such foolishness. It is folly to risk heaven on deceptive feelings. In Psalm 73, 24, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. The hundred. The 119th Psalm and verse 104 and 105, through thy precepts, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Oh, the beauty and power and majesty of those verses. You back up in the 119th Psalm, verses 9 through 11, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Oh, with my whole heart of assault thee, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Brethren, faith comes by hearing, not by feelings. We walk by faith, not by feelings. Second Corinthians 5 and 7, Paul says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. And Isaiah said in Isaiah 8 and 20, To the law and to the testimony, If any man speak not according to this word, It is because there is no light in him. And when I trust my feelings, And I put my feelings above, uh, Thus saith the Lord. Friends, I'm a fool. Number two. There's the unwritten gospel of tradition. Uh, in common usage, tradition refers to age-old practices and time-proven beliefs that have simply been handed down. Both the Greek word and the Latin word literally means to give up or over, to hand down, to transmit. So traditions are beliefs that have been handed down from one generation to another. And these traditions sometimes could be true. But these traditions, the majority of the time, because there is a good way and a, and a bad way that the, the word is used in the Bible. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the word tradition in the New Testament is it's a good sense. Uh, at least on occasions it's good, sometimes it's not good. So there's a good sense. It stands for the inspired truth as taught by the apostles. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Notice this. Paul says, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all the things. Now notice this. And keep the ordinances that I delivered as I delivered them unto you. The, the word ordinances in the King James is the same word for traditions. 
It's the same Greek word. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Paul says, Stand fast and hold the traditions you have been taught. So there's a good sense in which the word tradition is used. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and 6, Paul says, <clears throat> Now I command you, brethren, that you all walk according to the traditions which you have received of us. They well, some were not walking according to the traditions, and they were. Paul commanded the church at Thessalonica to withdraw their fellowship from them. So, oral or written truths that are transmitted to others is tradition, and there's nothing inherently wrong with the word. The word tradition is a good word in its proper context, but there's a bad sense in which the word is used. It's used as the doctrines and the precepts of man. Look with me in Matthew 15. We'll begin at verse number 2 and read down through verse number 9. Matthew 15, 2 through 9. Now the Pharisees, verse 1, and the scribes come to Jesus saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God? By your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whoso, uh, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is the gift by which, uh, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And then he says, You honor not your father and mother, he shall be free. Free from what? The care. Instead of taking his sons and caring for his elderly parents, he would just say, oh, it's a gift to the temple. It's a gift to the altar. And Jesus said, you dishonor your father and your mother in doing that, and you've not uh, obeyed the commandment of God. You've made it of none effect by your tradition, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, going back to Isaiah 29, 13, this people draw nigh to me with their mouths, they honor me with their lips, and their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That is a bad use. That is the word tradition that's used in a bad sense. Paul said in Galatians 1.14, he said, I profited in the Jews' religion above many of mine own equals. And he honored the traditions which he had received from his father. And so the traditions that Paul had received was taught, he was taught that Judaism was God's religion, and it was until Jesus came on the scene. But after Jesus came on the scene, Paul was still zealous for the traditions the, the Mishnah which was quote the explanation and the fleshing out of the Torah the Old Testament law you know the Torah is not a very big book the Mishnah would reach all the way across church building and it was these writings where they would made up all these rules a washing of hands and Hundreds of other rules. You remember Jesus said in Matthew 22, 23 and 2, He said, you bind heavy burdens to be bound, but you yourself <clears throat> will not lift a little finger to do them yourself. In Colossians 2 and 8, Paul says, be not deceived, let no man spoil you uh, with vain philosophies and the traditions of men and the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. So the word tradition is used both in a good sense and a bad sense. The Jewish traditions were the so-called oral precepts of Moses, which only illustrated and expanded the law, which was handed down from age to age to age. And the problem with these traditions is they made new laws. Their traditions were regarded as being authoritative just as much so as the written law of Moses. And Jesus was accused of violating these traditions, which he did. Jesus respected the law of God, but never respected the traditions of men. And with the majority of religions today, people say tradition, 
becomes gospel. What about the Catholics? They have a tradition of the infallibility of the Pope. It's not only a tradition, it's a lie. They say that when the Pope is sitting on the throne and speaks ex cathedra out of the throne, that he is more true than God himself. That he cannot make a mistake when he speaks from the throne. What about the Immaculate Conception? What about when you have one false doctrine, you got to make another false doctrine to prop it up? The Catholics and a lot of the Protestant uh, Reformation movement, they believe in inherited sin. So this Jesus came as born of a woman, right? And, and so if inherited sin is true, then Mary's a sinner. And if Jesus is born of her womb, he's going to pass that down to Jesus, or she's going to pass that down to Jesus. So we got to get Jesus into the world not being a sinner. So they come up with the Immaculate Conception. Friends, those are just traditions. They have no basis of truth. They are not found anywhere in God's word. They're found in the feverish brow and minds of people who have no respect for God and for his book. Protestants, they'll take the Lord's Supper on Christmas or Easter. They'll do it quarterly, uh, biannually. They'll do it, but they don't do it every week. And their tradition says, oh, and by the way, about 20 or more years ago, I was watching the news. And it was on, uh, I believe it's Channel 9 News out of Chattanooga. And if my memory serves me correctly, it was a Presbyterian church. They had brought their animals, their little cats and little dogs and goats and cows to the assembly. They were all out on the parking lot and the news cameras were there. The reels were rolling. And that church was giving the Lord's Supper, giving communion to their animals, to their pets. Friends, you talk about tradition blowing up in your face. Sprinkling for baptism, that's another tradition. That goes back to novation, and it was an innovation. And so, but it really wasn't a, a sprinkling with him. It was an effusion. They poured water on him, instrumental music. And on and on and on, one could go with tradition. It's just been handed down from one. I believe it because my daddy believed it. He believed it because his daddy believed it. And he believed it because his daddy believed it. And so you get all of these things in religion that are tradition because they've just been handed down. Oh, but brethren, what about us? Two songs and a prayer and you better not deviate. I mean, the Lord's Supper has to be before the preaching. It has to come directly after the prayer, the opening prayer. And then you have the uh, speech or the talk, uh, the presentation of the Lord's Supper. And then you have one song. Then you have the sermon. You have an invitation hymn. You better just have a verse at the end because that's the way we've always done it. And then the closing prayer. And if you deviate from this, you're somehow a liberal and you no longer love the Lord and I'm no longer going to be in fellowship with you. We have people that feel that way. But brethren, the Bible refutes tradition. Don't ever doubt it. Jesus never kowtowed to it and we must never kowtow to it either. These beliefs and practices may be old, but they're not as old as the New Testament. If it's new, it isn't true. And if it's true, it isn't new. It's at least 2,000 years old, bought and sealed by the blood of Christ. Now, they may be accepted by many people, traditions, but not by the Lord. And not by the people who follow and love the Lord. Number three, the unwritten gospel of custom. The human authority of custom and religion is widespread. Custom just simply means generally accepted conventions. If a practice or a belief is generally accepted by the majority, then that makes it right. 
If everybody else is doing it, it must be because it's right. We don't want to be an oddball. We're going to do it too. Everybody does this. Everybody does that. Everybody believes this. Everybody believes that. So they say tradition has to do with the past. Custom has to do with the present. The power of custom in our lives is, is very great. In the matter of just hairstyles or clothing or the car we drive or the house we live in or where we're able to work or our education. These are all things that want us to conform so that we don't look odd to somebody else. In the denominational world, they say, well, everybody else uses instruments of music. It must be right. Or everybody observes special days. I mean, the Lord's Supper and, excuse me, I mean, Christmas and Easter. Uh, they serve that as a religious holiday. Everybody else is doing it, they say. Everybody knows that baptism is not essential, so we're not going to practice it either. Morally, everybody drinks a little bit. Everybody dances a little bit. Everybody gambles a little bit. Everybody curses a little bit. Everybody dabbles in this, that, and the other a little bit, so it must be right. Brethren, the rightness of any action has never been proven by custom, nor by the number of people who engage in it. If the majority was how God determined right and wrong, he would have drowned Noah and saved the world. God has warned his people about following custom. In Genesis 6, 5 through 8, God looks out upon his creation. And <clears throat> this was pre noahic flood. Just before God commissions Noah to build the flood, God says that he looked out and every imagination of every heart was wicked and evil only continually. Well, that was the majority. Why wasn't that right? Why didn't God save them and drown Noah? Noah was the oddball. Exodus 23 and 2, God said, through Moses, that you're not to follow a multitude to do that which is evil. And Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Jesus was a nonconformist to custom. And he was regarded as odd. So odd they put him to death. But he was right. Customs vary, but God's principles of truth and righteousness do not. You go from here to Hong Kong, I promise you, custom will change. But you take this book in America or in Hong Kong, and it does not change. The Bible never, ever changes. Customs do. Number four, the unwritten gospel of human opinion. Now, the opinions of men are uh, the ultimate authority for many in religion. Oh, somebody will say, oh, he's such a good man. I, I just don't think he could be wrong. Or they'll say, well, he's such a scholar. I'm going to take his word for it. I need to read Acts 17, 11. But these were no more noble than those in Thessalonica, these Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the word of God daily and received it as it was, the word of God, and they checked up on the Apostle Paul. They wanted to know if Paul was teaching the truth or not. Should we not have that same nobility? That when a man stands up and says, I am a godly man, and he preaches some message, should we not take the Bible and just check it out. Our souls are at stake. Check it out. Check it out. And you'll be the better for it. Truth and honor have no thing to hide from. So you be honorable and you be noble. And you search and you honor the truth. Now the opinions of men are fallible at best. You got two good men. Two wise men. And one good man says one thing, and the other good man says the very opposite thing. One good man says, well, sprinkling is as good as immersion, and the other good man says, no, it's, baptism is by immersion. 
Brethren, which good man is right? Which good man is wrong? One preaches join the church of your choice. The other good man preaches the oneness of the Lord's church. Who is right? Who is wrong? By what standard are we going to measure their words? One preaches faith only and the other preaches an obedient faith. Brethren, if human opinion are the standard, then neither of these men are right and neither of them are wrong. Paul says, God made foolish the wisdom of the wise. 1 Corinthians 1.19. Romans 3.4 still says, Yea, let God be found true and every man a liar. And Galatians 1.6-12 still say, states, If any man bring any other gospel than that which they had preached and which the Galatians had received, Paul says, Let him be anathema, literally cut off. Brethren, in conclusion, I will say, the written gospel has its advantages. We can know the certainty of this book. We can know that it's right. We can know and know that we know that if we've done what this book says and live accordingly and follow the good Lord, we'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. We can believe it with confidence. Many other signs truly did Jesus that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. And that believing you might have life through his name. We have the written proof. It's not opinion, feeling, custom, or tradition. We have the proof of what is right and what is wrong. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, Matthew 4 and 4, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Thy word of a hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The written words of God will save, but the unwritten words of men will condemn. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejects me and receives not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, get that word spoken. Spoken means it was audible it was heard some people say oh the silence of the scripture we can go by the silence of the scripture jesus is not going to judge us by what it didn't say but what he doesn't say he's going to judge us by what he did say and again we're right back to isaiah 20 to the law and to the testimony if any man speak not according to this word it is because there is no truth in him. The unwritten gospels are not authoritative. They're not powerful. They're not convincing, nor are they infallible, but the word of God is. Brethren, drink deep from the word of God. You'll be the better for it, and you'll be so glad you did in eternity. I'm going to throw it back to Jonathan and Eric now. Thank you, brethren, for being such a fine, wonderful audience. Brother Robbie, as always, thank you for being here tonight. It was, um, I think somebody summed it up well. Four points or ten points. Robbie never disappoints. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good summation. Uh, it was fantastic, man. Uh, great job, as always. Thank you for being with us tonight. I sure appreciate that. You're welcome, and thank you for letting me be a part of the program. Yes, sir. Glad to have you back, Robbie. Thank you for coming on, uh, filling in for uh, for Greg. Uh, obviously, great job. Um, all of those things that you talked about, all those unwritten gospels that people try to follow, they do try to follow. Everything you talked about is is something that is the standard that people use to subvert the the, the written gospel time and time again. So, uh, a lesson that people need to take to heart very much. So, yes, sir. I'm ashamed to tell you, before I obeyed the gospel, I followed those two. Mm. Yeah. Paul said in Ephesians. That's sort of why I know a little bit about it. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> oh, well, go ahead, Rick. You got some, Eric? No, no. I was just thinking what Paul said in Ephesians 2, and we, we all walked according to the course of this world. Uh, so you were, certainly weren't alone in doing that. No, sir, not, not at all. Everybody's walked that path to one degree or another. Even people after they become Christians still try to walk that path. So 
Uh, anyway, Robbie, thank you for coming on. Appreciate you being here, being part of the program once again. We look forward to having you back. Um, assuming the schedule holds, we'll have you back in a couple of weeks, man. Yep. All right. Thanks, sir. Have a good one. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Um, before everybody starts to just go away on us, uh, see John Exum, who hosts our helps host our Friday uh, lineup, uh, is saying that we do have a Dismuke on this week. Uh, Anthony Dismuke will be on the uh, Friday night version of Connect, which we have shifted to being a, um, uh, a a night focused on some of the younger preachers in the Brotherhood. And Anthony Dismuke, Greg's son, will be on seven o'clock at on that. Uh, also, so also I uh, saw that Marlon Marlon Ratana was hanging out there in the comment section, uh, and he he has just gotten back from the Memphis lectures and is uh, uh, suffering from some jet lag flying from Memphis to Panama. I imagine that could happen, so he is not going to be doing his program uh, in the morning, and they will pick up on the uh, on the fourteenth uh, to continue his show with us. So Marlon will not be on tomorrow morning, but I assume Jonathan uh, or John rather will be on uh, during the afternoon where he normally uh, is. So we'll look forward to having that back uh, this coming week. Um, in terms of prayer request, uh, John also gives us one asking us to pray for his wife, Carly. Uh, she has been sick this week. Um, also some people talking about the passing of Robert Taylor. Uh, Robert Taylor Jr. passed right at the end of March, if I'm not mistaken, right? March 30th or something like that. Yes. Um, I don't, don't remember if we've talked about it here on this program or not, but that was a, a a stalwart, uh, um, you know, uh, just a, a pillar in the church that we, we've lost today and or, or lost recently and certainly pray for, uh, pray to God for giving thanks for his life with us, but also uh, remembering his family during this time as well. Um, Gwen is giving a prayer of thanks tonight. Uh, six months ago, she was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease and was referred to a specialist and did all the lab work and all that stuff. And uh, determined they do, that she does not have does not have chronic kidney disease. So that is that is a blessing. Uh, and then Christine is asking us to pray for uh, her grandson Grayson. He is still uh, fighting fevers, and um, doctors are telling us that he has a virus of some sort. It does not specify which one, but uh, he has been having that um, that struggle. Seems like maybe we may have prayed for that last week sometime or something. I don't remember exactly when that was, but. We will um, add Grayson to that list or keep Grayson in that list tonight. And I think that is everything I see. Do you have anything else, sir? Uh, no, I was just going to add that Greg is traveling to a gospel meeting, so I was going to pray for his safe travel. Uh, but other than that, no, not at all. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer then. All right. Let's pray together. Our, our faithful and loving, wonderful Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace with Thanksgiving in our hearts always, Father, just to uh, just to approach and to be able to do that boldly, confidently, because of the great and matchless gift of our our Lord uh, and Savior, who you sent to die for the sins of the world. Uh, Father, we're just always so appreciative of that. Uh, the the length and width and depth and height of your love is is just. Uh, it stretches us, it, it, it humbles us. We're just grateful as we try to comprehend uh, the love that you have for us. And we are so grateful and thankful to be your children. Thankful, Father, for your word that you uh, reveal through the spirit that we might know the truth and be made free as a result of it. And we pray as we heard tonight from Robbie that we will not uh, give our hearts or mind to anything other than uh, your word and follow after that. We pray for Robbie that his health will continue to improve and that he will uh, get better. Pray for his heart and uh, just pray that the doctors and those caring for him will inevitably, Father, eventuate into his, his wellness, that he might long continue to preach and teach your word. I'm thankful for the life he has committed to it and the time that he has done, the 25 years of laboring in that congregation, and pray that you will bless them as well. We mentioned the school of preaching tonight, and so we pray for all the schools of preachings, for those who direct them, for those who teach in them, uh, for the congregations that support them. Pray for the members, pray for those who attend, and just pray that these works will long continue, and that they will be faithful to you and to your cause, and that men and women can continually be strengthened, uh, prepared uh, in their faith. Uh, we pray for parents with young people that they might consider that 
and to encourage their young people to go uh, and to be trained in your word, to be strengthened in their faith. Uh, we pray for future deacons, elders, preachers. We just pray for the church, Father, uh, today and on into the future. We're prayerful for Carly, uh, John's wife, as she's been suffering with sickness. Pray that you'll bless her, Father, that she will be able to overcome. We're thankful and we rejoice with Gwen. Uh, so thankful for the diagnosis of the specialist that there is no, no kidney disease and pray that you'll bless her as well. Pray for Grayson. Um, we're always challenged when young people suffer. We just pray that you'll bless him, Christine, the whole family, and pray that the fever will eventually subside. Uh, prayerful for Greg as he travels, for his family. Pray that they will reach their destination safely. The gospel will be preached. Pray that souls will be saved and brethren will be encouraged. Father, we're thankful uh, to have Jonathan back and we're just thankful for this platform, for all those who make it possible, uh, for John and all of the others who participate. And we just pray that you'll bless the audience and be with us all, Father. We might live in a way that brings glory to your name. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good. Thank you, sir. Thanks for that. Um, over on the other side of things, um, I'm not sure we have the right bell for this one, sir. Um, <laughs> we got on the YouTube side, we got a hay with a $49.99 super sticker. So <laughs> an extra ring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, hey. <laughs> uh, we do appreciate that, hey. Um, let's see. Um, let me refresh here real fast. Because I just I clicked it and it didn't say Patsy for fifty stars, so it must it must not be up to date. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that or Patsy's not here tonight for some reason. We'll say it even if she didn't. Thank you, Patsy. Hey, it's there. I refreshed it. It's there, Patsy. Thank for you, Patsy. Uh, and we got Sabro or Sabrono with a hundred stars. Thank you, Sabrono. Uh, and we got Valletta with 200 stars. Thank you, Valletta. Sir. You've been uh, saying those names since uh, this has woo, been a baby. Going back for a while. Yeah. 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 I say with, with those three, Hayes going to have to do a few more of those $49 super stickers to catch up with those three. <laughs> <laughs> at, at 50 stars a night from Patsy, after about 600, 600, 700 uh, nights, starts to add up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Those are, that's old school right there, boy. That's a ways back. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. All right, everybody. Great to have you all on with us this uh, this week. Uh, look forward to uh, having John host the Friday program tomorrow. Uh, next week, I'm going to try and make sure we are back to a full schedule. I have been running behind on getting some scheduling done. Uh, I know Monday, if I remember off the top of my head, we have, well, one new speaker, uh, Randy Cole Sims, is going to be with us. Randy. Uh, preaches right up the road for me on the, at the Fisk Boulevard congregation. Um, I'm not sure how he's going to do on this on this format because Randy's a walker. I mean, he drives it when he speaks at, at Rockledge. He walks back and forth, drives our camera people crazy. I'm not sure how he's going to do it <laughs> <laughs> sitting in one spot. But uh, you're going to you're going to want to tune in and hear Brother Sims. Brother Sims is just uh, dynamic and, and insightful with the text. He, he is a uh, he's a he's a good. One. You're gonna you're gonna enjoy hearing him. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we're going to have Paul Mays on in the second hour on Monday. It's been a while since we've had him on the main show. And so I thought to get Paul back on here with us um, and try and do some of our guys. And Jonathan, John was on. I'm, John, I'm going to make that transition eventually from Jonathan to John. I will, I promise. Uh, but had him on a couple times recently. Going to try and get Paul Mays on here. It's been forever since we had Daryl Broking on during the night. So I'm trying to get Daryl booked. Some of those guys get them get them uh, exposure back to our main audience. So uh, look for, look, looking to have them back on shortly. But I believe Paul, if I'm not mistaken, is this Monday. Uh, and that's what I have off the top of my head. So uh, hopefully we'll have the full schedule running next week. I have been running behind on getting some of that done, but uh, should be able to take care of that hopefully this coming week. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, you got anything else, sir? I do. This will be the first time you're hearing this too. And it's, I kind of probably could have waited, but uh, I'm going to be traveling next week to uh, to the meeting where Greg is preaching. So I'm going to attend that meeting. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a, a bunch of family there. So I'm going to go and be in the audience to hear Greg preach. Look forward to that. Okay. What, what does it, is it a high level secret where Greg is doing the meeting or? No, he's actually going to Rockford. That's where he's going. 
Oh, oh yeah, he did right. He told me that. Yes, that's just right. Okay, so going up to see him, and that's uh, that's the old homestead, huh? Yeah, man. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some uh, some family locally, cousins, friends, and uh, maybe all the way back to high school. We'll see. Okay, well, say hi to all the folks. Uh, Vernon and. I don't know who else I still know up there, probably. Bobby, <laughs> Bobby coming down? Uncle Bobby coming down? I hope so. We'll, right, we'll certainly encourage it. All right. Well, say hi to Uncle Bobby for me if you see him. Absolutely. All right. Well, we will go ahead and sign off. And, again, thank you all for tuning in and being a part of the show tonight. And, Lord willing, we'll see you back here. Well, we'll see, I'll see you back here Monday. Uh, but we'll see you back here on Digital Bible Study throughout the day uh, tomorrow. As always, it is our prayer. You will go out and make your day a great one for God.